In the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, amen. Direct, O Lord, all our actions by thy holy inspirations, and carry them on by thy gracious assistance, so that every prayer and work of ours may begin from thee, and by the behalf of it through Christ our Lord. Amen. amen. Our Lady of Divine Grace, pray amen. for us. In the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, amen. This conference is going to be on piety. Now, most people have a complete misunderstanding of the term piety. Um, they tend to think it's what a, a little old lady does in the back of the church, and that's not exactly correct. That's a kind of a brave broad, but it's not the traditional use, actually, of that term. Um, <clears throat> piety, St. Thomas Aquinas defines as a, the virtue by which we give honor to those who are above us, so that's the first part of the definition. So the first has to do with those who are above us. So piety has two parts to it. One, that you give honor. We're going to talk about what honor is to those who are above us. This is something that obviously has completely collapsed. And we'll talk a little bit about why that happened historically. But honor is, uh, St. Thomas defines honor as praise or some kind of action that... Uh, for someone's excellence. So it's something that you do to make recognition of or to show or to point out to people someone's excellence. Now, in another place he says, what does this excellence consist in? He says it consists in virtue. Now, virtue can be of two kinds. One, in the sense of some type of power that a person has or some type of position of authority, or it can also refer to um, the, the person who actually has virtue in the sense of uh, an operative habit, that is, the habit in which I'm in, uh, a virtue is a good habit in which I'm in the habit or I'm in the practice of always doing the right thing at the right time in relationship to this particular thing. So a person who has the habit of temperance, or the virtue of temperance, has the ability to be around food without you know, eating too greedily or eating too quickly or eating too much, etc. So that's what that virtue actually consists in. So this honor, so then we give honor to those who are above us, but what do we mean by above us? Well, there's different ways in which people are above us. The second one, and we're going to talk more about that, the second part of it is, is that piety also deals with proper, the technical term is solicitude, but care for those beneath us. Now, obviously what's implied here is we are not an egalitarian world. You know, there's that whole line from Animal Farm, well, some pigs are more equal than others, right? If you, I don't know if you, has anyone read Animal Farm? Yeah, okay. So, which basically means, you know, they, they wanted to argue that everybody was equal, but in the end, it's not that case. It's not that way, because in the end, there's always going to be somebody above you in relationship to the decisions they're going to make that impact your life, etc. So, that whole idea that everybody is absolutely equal... Uh, was a misunderstanding, but it came around as a result of certain philosophical notions in the 16 and 17 hunters that came to fruition during the French Revolution. So, and then from the French Revolution on, it basically plagued almost all of Western culture that everybody is absolutely equal, which of course we know isn't the case. There's a difference between equality and nature. All of us have human nature. We're all human beings. On that level, we're equal. However, <clears throat> there are certain aspects to us that are not just us as human beings, they're addition ab above and beyond us as being human beings. So, for example, there is, uh, you can be a human being and you can be a man or a woman. You can, be, you can have red hair, white hair, green hair, in some people's case. You can have, um, there's different degrees of intelligence, but there's also different positions in life that some people have because of their station in life. They're simply above other people because they're the boss, etc. And so that indicates that, in point in fact, there's not an egalitarian. We, we aren't equal in relationship to some things, but in relationship to human nature, we are. It's the, because of human nature. So like when you talk about what is just, justice is when you give to somebody what's due to them. You owe that to them because of, of for some reason. So for example, if someone asks me, or if I ask somebody, look, you mow your, my lawn and I'll give you $15 an hour. Well, he mows the lawn, it takes him two hours, and so I give him 30 I, 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 In justice, I owe him $30, right? So, and there has been, injustice always implies a proportion between 
what I owe the person, or what, what's owed to the person, and what I give to them. Piety is a virtue that's underneath the virtue of justice. Because in piety, the honor that I give to the people above me has to be proportionate to the people, to the person's position in life. So I'm obviously going to give more honor to, say, say someone like the Pope or the President than I am going to be um, to, say, you know, somebody who happens to just be a, um, a mayor here in town. Obviously, there's different degrees of honor based upon the different degree of excellence that they possess, either by the power or the authority. But also, we tend to give people, as a, just human beings, God structured us a certain way. He designed human nature, much like a mechanic builds a car. He intends it to do very specific things, and so God designed human nature to function a certain way. And so uh, we have natural. then he inclined us to do those things that he had intended for us to do. Now, obviously, after the fall of Adam and Eve and after people started committing sin, that all gets derailed and it goes off the path. And so we get opposite um, inclinations. That's why St. Paul says, you know, um, this, or and even Christ said the Spirit's willing, but the flesh is weak. But also you have... St. Paul talking about how he wants to do one thing, but the flesh is dragging him in another direction. And so that's the result of the sin. But that means, though, that we have natural inclination. God designed us to perform certain kinds of functions. And one of them is to perform the acts of virtue. And so we find ourselves naturally giving honor, if we have a proper upbringing, naturally giving honor to those people who are above us. What's happened in our culture, because everybody thinks that all of that is doesn't exist, or they want to act like it doesn't exist, because they even will admit it exists. Um, and there's even certain positions in our own culture that we insist that these people are treated a little bit differently, like congressmen and um, the president, etc. We treat them differently. Um, the, uh, by the way, we're going to talk about what do you do when one of these guys in position of honor is a schluck. But, so we'll talk about that in a little bit. Um, but the point is, is that uh, we, we recognize that these people have to be treated differently, right? Okay. As for those who are beneath us, it's considered pious in the sense of the person takes proper care so that the people beneath them, uh, so that the people beneath them have what's necessary in order for them to lead the life that God had intended for them to lead. Because sometimes God puts people in authority. In fact, the entire tradition of the church has said that authority is never for the one who has it. It's the finality of authority is not for me, say, as a priest who has authority over certain people, that's not what it's there for. It's actually, my authority is there for the sake of the people that I'm governing. It's not for me. So, in fact, St. Thomas defines a tyrant as someone who, who directs his power and the, the common good of the society towards his own benefit, rather than for, towards what is best for the people underneath them. Okay. This notion of piety, because... When you have this kind of this egalitarian idea where everybody is equal, you end up destroying this whole sense of honor and, and, and uh, honor that has to be given to people, and as a result, justice is lost. And then in the end, in our, in the culture just becomes unjust. Okay, so there are, however, different kinds of piety. We'll talk about what do you do when one of the guys that's above you just doesn't seem to have his act together. Okay. So, of piety, there are three kinds. The first is domestic piety. And this is the primary meaning of the term. In fact, the first time you ever see in, a, in any kind of philosophical work a long, tri long discussion of piety is in Plato, one of the dialogues of Plato, where he talks about one of the, the son is going to court to sue his father for impiety. And so Socrates says, oh, then you must know a lot about piety. And the guy says, yes, I do. And by the time the dialogue's done, the guy realizes he doesn't know the first thing about piety. So because he's doing what? He's suing his father in court when he shouldn't be suing his father in court because he should be honoring his father, not suing him. Okay, so domestic means within the home. There's a certain kind of hierarchy within the home. The parents, of obviously, are in charge of the children. They have authority over the children. Children know this by nature, even though they're disobedient from time to time. Children know that they have to obey their parents. And it, it, it's, you see this even with kids that are younger. The parents tell them, don't do this and do that. And the kids will do it. There's just, we're just designed that way. Okay. This domestic structure, therefore, it's not just between parents and children, but it's also between husband and wife. 
This is why St. Paul said, wives be submissive to your husbands. So where part of this went awry was um, the fathers of the church say that when Adam was created, he was put over all the animals, right? So God brings all the animals to him, and he recognizes, okay, none of this is, is my equal. None of this is, is, you know, the one that should be for me. Finally, he creates Eve and brings Eve to, to, um, to Adam. And then Eve, um, as, soon as, Saint, or as soon as Adam sees him, he says, finally, this is bone of my bone and flesh of my flesh. In other words, it's, it's equality of nature. However, St. Thomas says, and this is a very fascinating thing, St. Thomas says that in that state, when Eve was created, she was still created into a state of subordination. Now, today, by subordination, people don't understand how these terms are properly to be understood at all. He said subordination, that state of subordination meant that she was under him because she was his helper, which meant he was in charge, it was his responsibility, which is something we're going to talk about at length later when we talk about um, you know, what it really means to be a man. But he, he was put in charge, given responsibility, and then Eve's function is there to assist him in fulfilling those obligations that he has in his responsibility. So she's still under him. But St. Thomas says that the hallmark of that state for women is that piety was ruling. So that Adam took care of her, he was solicitous of her, he made sure she had what she wanted, he didn't abuse her, he didn't mistreat her, etc. And then she had this natural inclination to be subordinate to Adam. Okay. Then, what happens is, is at the fall, Eve eats the fruit. Now the fathers say that Adam, that the father of the household is the one to determine the cult of the family. By cult we mean the worship and how that is supposed to play itself out within the family. So, the... Um, when Eve, and part of the cult, sorry, part of the cult is the code, that is, what, how we're supposed to li live our lives is part of our understanding of how we give honor and glory to God, who ultimately, true piety is ultimately to God, because he's the one that's ultimately above us, which we'll talk about a little bit later. Okay, so, Adam, Eve, what, what happens is, is Eve goes and eats the fruit aside from Adam, which means she violated his rights to determine the religious practices within the family. She eats the fruit, then she hands it to Adam, and by that handing of it, she tried to take control of him. And so afterward, and then what does Adam do? Adam eats the fruit. The problem with that is, is as we'll see here, um, once we start talking about masculinity, the problem is, is when Adam ate the fruit, he capitulated his authority and he ended up, uh, and his responsibility, he was unwilling to be separated from his wife. And so as a result of that, as a result of that, he ended, up, uh, he ended up with his own sets of problems, but Eve ended up with the problem of trying to control her husband. So there's this constant thing she has to struggle with, even though she's inclined to be subordinate, she has to struggle with this thing of not wanting to be subordinate. Okay, That's why St. Paul comes along, and St. Paul, to reestablish the order of piety, says... Women be sub submissive to your husbands. By submissive, it means follow the order which God had established by the natural law and putting the husband as the head of the household. But then he says to the husband, husbands, love your wives. Why does he have to love your, why do you have to love the wife? Because then the other aspect of piety, remember there's two parts of piety. Honoring those who are above us, but then also taking due care and solicitude of those who are under us. And by that care means ultimately that you love them, that you want what's best for them. Okay. So that's the order that St. Paul established. So if they establish that, so if the husband loves his wife, he's not going to abuse her and treat her badly. On the other hand, if the wife is submissive, then she'll be submissive to the husband, and that order within the family will find its right order. Piety has completely collapsed in our culture. And part of the reason it's completely collapsed, one of the ways you can see it, is that young people have absolutely no respect whatsoever, either for their parents or for elders. Because part of being an, of excellence, remember that virtue, that habit? Well, when you get older, when people get older, although in our culture some of the older people are getting as nutty as they, you know. But anyway, the point is, as you get older, you're supposed to be a little bit more mature, wiser, and a little bit more virtuous, right? And so as a general rule, the younger people are supposed to have 
um, a certain piety or give a certain honor and deference and respect to those people who are above them, that is, those people who are older, that's completely collapsed in our culture, which is a serious issue. And once that happens, of course, once that lack of respect and honor for our elders, this is why as soon as the parents end up in the nursing home, the kids are just looking to find somebody who will overdose them with morphine so they can get them out of their hair, right? So this is one of the signs that you're actually seeing. So there's domestic, and, that, and the one thing you always have to remember is part of piety is to maintain peace. See, one of the real problems with Adam is, is that after he ate the fruit, he just wants peace. He doesn't want his wife nagging at him. He doesn't want her doing this. He, doesn't want, he just wants peace, right? So a lot of times he'll capitulate to her just to have peace. Well, the problem is, is that that's not right order. The definition of peace is the tranquility of order. That's what St. Augustine calls it. Tranquility means quiet. When there's peace, there's a quiet because things are rightly ordered. So when um, within the family, if the domestic piety is observed, where the children are being obedient to their parents, and the, um, the parents are following that right order, um, where the husband is loving his wife and taking due care and solicitude of her, and then the children, and then the wife is being submissive, peace will settle in the home. You see it every time. You just see it as soon as the, you can. You can walk into a household and be there ten minutes and know whether there's pi there's this peace, and that tranquility, and that order, and whether there's true piety within the family. Okay. This is domestic. The next one is civil piety. This is in relationship to those who hold some type of um, civil office or natural office. So this is why, in the past, you know, kings and things of that sort, and also now, you know, presidents and um, people who are the head of prime ministers, there's a certain honor that's given to them because of the excellence that they have in relationship to this authority. Their obligation, however, which, of course, is also a sign, because you see this today. People, whenever they talk about anybody in authority anymore, they just make these offhand comments, and there's no absolutely respect whatsoever for the guy's office as president or what have you. On the other hand, the guys that are in the office very often have absolutely no piety either, because they're not interested in taking care of people. How do we know this? They pass a health care bill where everyone gets strapped with it but themselves. They're not, they don't care about other people. They're just worrying about themselves. Or they'll pass laws that they know is onerous and difficult and causes damage, but they don't care because of some political agenda or what have you. And so how do we get this reestablished? Well, there's one of the principles in the Old Testament is you get the leaders you deserve. We have the current people in positions of power around the world, not just in this country, but around the world, precisely because people are not leading lives worthy of having a decent leader. This guy, for example, I'll have to chop this out of the audio, but the guy that we have in the White House right now is a split mirror image of our culture. He's completely self-absorbed. He spends all his time doing what? Uh, going out and recreating, playing golf, although I kind of like the fact that he plays golf because that keeps him out of the White House. He, he spends all, he's, he, he has absolutely no respect for anybody else, etc. This is our culture. People are completely into themselves. Perfect proof is they did a study and found out that 80% um, of college age kids between the ages of 22 to 18 and 22 suffer, 80%, are, can be legitimately diagnosed with narcissistic disorder. It's a clinical condition. They're so self-absorbed, that's where it's at. These people voted for this guy because they thought they were going to get something out of it. They weren't looking to see whether it was good for the common good, that is true piety, which is looks for what's good for everybody. Instead, what did they do? They ended up voting for this guy because they thought they were going to get something out of it. All these people wanting entitlements, they're thinking they're going to get something out of it. Okay. The second side of it is, is that this guy spent so much time in recreation. One of the signs of our culture is, is that people, I mean, you see this with, with kids growing up, Boys, and this is one of the reasons that we'll talk about this when we get to the whole effeminacy question, you see boys who will spend literally three to five, maybe even six or seven hours a day either on the computer, watching TV, or doing things that has absolutely nothing to do with building character. It's just all about recreation. And that's what this guy is. I mean, this guy is just a reflection of our culture. All the disorders we see in it is just showing us who we are. So the point is, is in the Old Testament, God basically gives us the leaders we deserve which is kind of scary. Okay, 
So what, do we, what is our obligation in relationship to showing him honor? Your obligation, the moralists have always said, your obligation is still to honor the office. It does not mean you have to have honor for the character of the individual that's in it. So that means when he's in your presence, it, you know, you should treat him as the President of the United States. Because why? You want this virtue. You can't let the fact that he's a schluck affect your virtue. That's ultimately what it boils down to. All the leaders that we have that are really problematic, you cannot let their problems make you lose virtue. Instead, what you do is you still treat them with honor, you still treat them with respect, even if they're not perfect, so that you maintain that virtue. And then you'll become worthy of having a better leader. The other side of it, though, too, is you have to have honor for the office. That doesn't mean, though, that you don't pray or do things, even maybe on a political level, to get them out or to get rid of them or to block certain things that they do. Because that's not disrespectful, that your obligation is to the good of the society. Okay. Then the last one is religious. Piety. And religious piety has to do with two, two parts. One primarily has to do with God. Of course, God contains all excellence within himself. He is due all honor and all praise. In fact, every honor that we give to someone in this life is really just because of the fact that we're honoring God for some excellence that God has given to that person and that that person somehow reflects. It, that is, that person reflects some excellence in God. So, in the final analysis, then, it's all, all, ultimately all piety is due to God. That's why sometimes people would say, oh, she's very pious because she's praying in the church. Yeah, but that's kind of a loser. That's, that's more of devout, the term devout, where the person is, through their will, they really have a strong attachment to God. That's different from the actual piety where a person is seeking to give honor. So, that's the first part. The second one is then, and then the ministers of God. That is, those who God sends on his behalf. Now, this ministers is a broad term because it can not only mean just the priest, etc., but it can also mean one's parents. It can also mean the other people who are above us who administer some particular religious aspect in relationship to us because the parents are the ones who teach us religion primarily, and so, at least under most normal circumstances, and so what happens is, is be, um, they're the ones who we have to give honor because, as if we're giving honor to God. Because they're representing him in some way when they teach us these particular things. Okay. All this piety is an important thing because it's the piety within a culture is what gives it right order. It's one of the things in addition to justice and other virtue. But it's one of the first things that has to be established one of the first, not the first, but it's one of the things that has to be established. Obviously, in relationship to religious piety, we have to give due honor to God. This has been completely removed from our social life. The, one of the difficulties with not just the French Revolution, but it was a buildup of a, a series of, of philosophers and philosophical ideas that finally led to this idea of separation of church and state. Everyone says separation of church and state in the Constitution. It's nowhere in the Constitution. The point, in fact, is, is that, um, and putting that all aside, even if it were in the Constitution, it means that there's a problem with the Constitution. Why? Because God has care of the whole universe. The political life is not some separate entity that exists independent of the universe. It's part of the universe that God created, and therefore, even the civil society has an obligation, civil part of the society has an obligation to give God his due. Now, obviously, they're not going to be doing things like saying mass and stuff like that, but they are going to make sure that people can fulfill their religious obligations and make sure that anything that offends God is not part of the culture. And so it's not until this religious piety gets fully established. This is why I always tell people, the real problem in our culture is not the violation of the Sixth Commandment, that is, committing sins uh, against chastity. It's not the primary problem. In fact, in the Old Testament, you look very close at it, and it's very clear that every time they violate the first commandment, which is giving God his due, which, by the way, piety is really the virtue of the fourth commandment, honor your parents. It's basically what it's saying is fulfill the obligations of piety. But 
it's not, the, viola- the violations of the first commandment in the Old Testament always lead to violations of the sixth. Always. And so the problem with our culture is not the sixth commandment. The problem with abortion is not the violation of the fifth. The problem with abortion and that stuff is the violation of the first. We've removed God from the culture, and as a result, there's nothing, because once God's out of the picture, so is the natural law that he created. He's the, he's the one who created us. And so that's all gone. In fact, that's what ended up happening. The Supreme Court, if I'm not mistaken, in 1932, I think is the year, could be a little earlier, in 1932 said that the civil law isn't based upon the natural law. It's not based upon what God had determined. So basically, you can have civil law do anything it wants. It's completely free. It's at whatever the will of the people, the people are. Well, that's seriously problematic. And so this is where this all ends up heading. So that if God is taken from the, uh, the civil sphere, and even the domestic sphere, if he's taken away from out of that, then what's going to happen is the piety collapses ultimately. This is why people who raise their children with no fear of God, who don't have them have any, any aspect of religion whatsoever, are always scratching their head why their kids are complete mongrels and disobedient and out of control. Well, that's what you, you, you basically told them, this is the most important, God isn't important, and so... There's no, I'm not going to give honor to him, so if you're not going to give honor to him, why should I give honor to you? Is the logic of it. Okay. And so this is where it all kind of rests. One last thing about the civil side of it is, we call this um, patriotic. That's kind of the term that we use for, for piety. That's the term for it in that we kind of generally tends to use. Patriotic comes from the Latin word... Uh, pater, which means father, it literally means um, uh, the fatherland. No, I'm not. It's not. Doesn't. If we're not referring to the the Hitler type of thing, but just it means um, in patria. The term patria literally meant in heaven, or also, but it means the country of our birth. So that's what the whole notion of patriotic is. So a person who's patriot gives honor to the country in which they live. What's happening is is the patriotic stuff, I'm sure you've noticed, is completely collapsing as well. Now, patriotic does not mean you sign off because some politician says, you know, we're going to go to war with um, with Outer Mongolia, and if you're not behind it, you're not patriotic. That's hogwash. What ultimately determines patriotic is if it brings honor to the country. That may mean... That may mean that you have to go to war. And if that means you have to go to war, then you should back the war as a matter of piety. But if it doesn't, if it's actually going to detract from your honor, the honor of your country, you should not support it. Now, that doesn't mean that the people who go off to the war, that you should somehow treat them like Jane Fonda did. What she did was absolutely unconscionable. You know, the way she treated these, the, the veterans coming back. The veterans are doing what their obligations are. But the point is, is that the patriotic is, means what? That you support those things in the country that actually bring it honor. What's that honor? Excellence of its citizens. What's that excellence considering? Consistent virtue. If it's not going to bring virtue to your citizens, you don't do it. On the other hand, a lot of people are saying that certain things are patriotic when they're in fact not patriotic at all. And so that's the problem you have to be careful. So I'm seeing that there's... As I sit and watch, especially traditional Catholics sometimes, you kind of just watch the complexion of them, and they're, they're, I suppose it's the general culture that this is happening to. There's this kind of this split that's starting to happen, where there's those who are literally bashing their own country, which is not giving it honor, rather than saying, you know, I really don't think our country should be involved in, you know, providing sterilization for women in Africa, for example. It's perfectly patriotic. You can talk about that. You know, you can talk about the fact that, you know, Kennedy was one of the ones who started that nonsense, and so maybe Kennedy wasn't the most best president. Okay, that's fine to give a legitimate criticism of it, but that's different from just bashing your country and wishing ill on your country. That's contrary to piety. On the other hand, you have these people who are just completely blind without taking a close look at what constitutes true piety. Now, obviously, you can find certain things within the civil sphere which, you know, you're not really clear, clear if it's going to be good or bad for your country. And so you can, there's legitimate debate within those things. But other things, there shouldn't be legitimate debate in relationship to it. So, 
Um, you know, so one of the things is, you know, I think everybody should get to smoke marijuana. It's patriotic, you know. Our country is free, and it's, you know, we're a free country. It's patriotic. Well, first of all, we're not a very free country. We're 34th, I think, now on the list. Um, the point is, as far as freedom goes, but the point is, is that what's patriotic is what's good for the country, not just what everybody gets to do for themselves.